Hi there. I'm a bit scared because, uh, you know, uh, some of us are afraid that robots will replace us. And uh, so, uh, my presentation is called uh, Algorithm Driven Design or Will Robots Replace Designers? And uh, uh, let me see how it works. Uh, which button should I put? Should I press? No, I should be replaced by robots. <laughs> <laughs> ah, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, McKinsey, they asked themselves the same question and they analyzed 800 jobs to find how easily they can be replaced. And there are lots of interesting insights and uh, you can dig through it and see if you can be replaced. Uh, who of you are afraid of this, of being replaced by robots in design? Somewhere else? Yeah. Uh, and uh, if you remember the Grid CMS example, it was a tool that was praised as uh, something uh, smart that can choose templates and uh, crops uh, uh, touch photos all, all by itself and then it uh, runs uh, a run TV test to uh, choose the most suitable patterns. And uh, many uh, technologists uh, said that uh, the bullet designers will be replaced. Uh, but uh, while well, the product was in a private beta, a uh, designer news community uh, found real world examples of websites created with the grid. And they had a mixed reaction because people criticized the design and code quality. And many skeptics opened a champagne bottle on the day. So, the idea to fully replace a designer with an algorithm, uh, yeah, it sounds futuristic, but the whole point is wrong. Because if you look at what we do at our jobs as product designers, we help to translate a raw product idea into a well thought out user interface. Uh, we apply solid interaction principles and a sound information architecture and a visual style to it. And at the same time, we help a company to achieve its business goals and turn its brand. So it's much more than uh, making mockups in some design tool. Uh, last year, uh, the technological foundations for these tools became, became easily accessible and the design community uh, got interested in all the things, things like algorithms, neural networks, machine learning and artificial intelligence. So I think that's, uh, that now is the time to rethink the modern role of designer. And I think that uh, we better look at it uh, as a creative collaboration with algorithms when we can work in pair with uh, those algorithms to solve product tasks. And uh, you know that uh, product designers have learned to juggle many tools and skills to near perfection. And uh, a new term emerged called a product designer instead of a visual designer and the UX designer and so it's a unified role. Uh, however, there are many skills and it's really hard to balance all of those skills uh, in one role. Uh, there are a lot of tools, new tools that uh, simplify our work and help us, uh, that help us to save time. Uh, but anyway, we took even more responsibilities every year. So, on one hand, we uh, have new tools, uh, in another hand, we have new responsibilities. So, we have to find a way to optimize our work even more. So, we need to automate and simplify our product work process even more. And I built a website called uh, algorithms.design where I collected a lot of uh, examples of those tools. Uh, I also published uh, an article on Smash Magazine uh, about this idea, so it has a lot of examples of real-world applications of these tools. And I'll show you some of them. I divide them into three groups. Uh, the first group is when we can construct AI with these tools. Uh, a good example uh, is uh, uh, with publishing tools like Medium, Vidimac and Squarespace that already simplified how this work. So you didn't have to build your uh, website yourself, you didn't have to pay for a designer, you know, just log in here and create your website in 10 minutes. And it saves, it saves a lot of time for you. And there's an opportunity to make this in place even smarter so that the barriers to entry uh, gets even lower. Uh, and that's what uh, Wix uh, website constructor does. They implemented the idea of the grid into their product and uh, made it available to millions of people. Uh, so uh, a lot of non-professionals uh, can create a better website. And uh, surely, as in the case of the grid, uh, projecting designers from the creative process leads to cliché uh, and mediocre results, even if it improves oral quality. But if we consider uh, this process more like pair design with computer, uh, then we can upload here a lot of routine tasks. Of course, we can create a revolutionary product in this way, but we could free time to create one. Moreover, everyday tasks are utilitarian and don't require a revolution. And if a company has a design system, then algorithms could uh, make it even more powerful. 
Uh, one example is from uh, Florian Schulz. He tried the idea of interpolation of components. So you define two edge states of components, and then it, uh, the algorithm proposes uh, uh, different states of those components for you. My interest, uh, my interest uh, in this uh, uh, topic spun in 2012 when we tried to create an automated magazine layout. So we had a technology news website uh, that had a pretty poor semantic structure and uh, it was really expensive to update all of those articles by hand. So we defined a special script that would parse through an article and then, depending on its content, I mean the number and size of paragraphs, and the number and size of photos, tables, uh, quotations and other elements, it would propose uh, a nice and beautiful uh, magazine layout uh, template for it, for this uh, chunk of the article. And then it mixed uh, all of those chunks together to see how it works together. And uh, Flipboard, they launched a pretty similar model uh, called Duplo a couple of years ago. And Vox Media, they have uh, course CMS uh, and uh, they try to apply this idea to Vox.com uh, news website. <coughs> so they have an algorithm, algorithm that uses uh, all the patterns uh, out of the Zen system. It tries to fill those patterns with the content of uh, current day. Um, then it tries to create a harmonious composition of a home page and then it runs A-B tests to see uh, what works best. So, without any help of a designer, uh, a, uh, a home page of a new site is compiled on the day. Another group of examples in which one can, create, uh, can prepare assets and content with those tools. Because, you know, creating good color uh, graphic assets in many variations uh, is one of the most boring parts of a designer's work. It takes so much time and it is demotivating when designers could spend this time on more valuable product work. Uh, one example is from Yandex, uh, when they try to automate an algorithm to predict uh, color for app cards in their Android launcher. So uh, they looked at uh, the app icon and uh, uh, proposed a harmonious color for uh, this card, of app card. There are other examples when you can predict a wearable here for a design, like uh, in the Guardian and the Berg example. They try to highlight photos in news articles to emphasize emotion uh, in this message of the, of the article. But uh, this, there, these examples are pretty simple, so uh, it's where you can just control one variable. But we can go even further and create the whole composition with that. Uh, it is another example for Yandex. Uh, Yandex Market, they have a simple tool for marketers. Uh, it's a web page when a marketer could upload uh, an image of a gadget, then type in uh, the numbers of the gadget in this collection, and then it generates endless number of those uh, banners for you, uh, and all of those banners are conformed to design guidelines. So uh, you don't need to make all of those banners yourself. And Netflix, they went even further, and they created a truly crazy script that uh, crops movie characters from posters, uh, then it applies a uh, stylized and localized movie title to it and runs automatic user experiments. So they, they create thousands of those banners without any help of a designer. And uh, the team at Engadget, they did the same with the text. They nurtured a robot apprentice to write uh, simple news articles about gadgets. We all remember last year it was a huge hype with style transfer apps like Prisma that uh, could help you to uh, take a photo and apply a style of famous artist to it. So here's a rhetorical question. Will those net neural networks make illustrators obsolete because you can take a style of an illustrator, apply it to some photo and then you don't need this illustrator? I doubt it will uh, replace those uh, illustrators with a solid and unique style, but I think that it will help uh, a lot of companies to produce uh, cheap illustrations when you don't need something unique and you can do it for cheap to uh, differentiate from other products. Uh, there are even mo more complex examples with uh, life identity, uh, like in this uh, Wolf Olin's OI Telecom example, uh, which reacts to sound. And you just can create uh, such crazy stuff uh, like this without creative collaboration with algorithms. Third part is when we can personalize UX for our audience segment or even specific users. We see it every day in Facebook, news feeds, Google search results, uh, in Netflix and Spotify recommendations, and many other products. Besides the fact that uh, it relieves the burden of users uh, of filtering this uh, uh, vast amount of information, uh, it uh, strengthens in connection to the brand uh, when uh, uh, a product proposes uh, b b better content for a user. 
But here's a, a problem, because as Jens Goblin shows, uh, in the example of uh, Spotify Discover Weekly feature, the only element of a classic UX is a small track list on the bottom of the screen. So what is the role of a designer here? To make a mock-up uh, of this track list in two minutes, send it back to a developer and go away? And our job is finished. Uh, but uh, we should uh, see uh, how other people do it, uh, like Airbnb. Uh, the designers, uh, the same team, they uh, 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 collaborated with developers to uh, answer a question. Uh, what will the booked price of listening will be on any given day in the future? So they predicted uh, the price of a booking, so um, uh, apartment owners could get more money out of uh, Airbnb and they ha had a better experience out of Airbnb. And here's also anticipatory design with uh, tools like uh, Google Now and Siri that can, for example, propose uh, a way home to, uh, from work uh, using location history data. So, I think that we should look at it uh, as an exoskeleton for designer. So, uh, uh, it will be a set of tools that will increase the number and depth of decisions we can get through without uh, spending our time on routine tasks. But what tools do we need here? If you look back uh, at the middle uh, of the last century, uh, computers were envisioned as a way to extend human capabilities. Wolf Peters, uh, Peters and Samir Vinegar, uh, they analyzed uh, computing history in detail, uh, and the idea of augmentation of human ability in detail. And they see uh, three levels of maturity for design tools. First generation systems uh, mimic analog tools with digital means. The second generation is assisted creation systems when, where humans and machines negotiate the creative process through uh, tight action feedback loops. And third generation is assisted creation system 3.0, which negotiates the creative process in fine grained concessions uh, and augment creative capabilities and accelerates the exhibition of skills from novice to expert. And we need uh, uh, some tools here. Uh, if we look at uh, the design process we go through, we uh, try to find uh, the most available solution of problems for users and uh, the business. Then we try to find the best solution for this problem. Then we try to design and develop the solution. Then we launch, evaluate, and optimize the solution. So we need two types of tools here. One set is analysis tools, and I think that's that's where we are the best uh, as designers because uh, uh, an algorithm could hard, hardly replace uh, uh, research like ethnography. Uh, it couldn't go to business house and see how it works. So we are safe here. Uh, but uh, if we can explore uh, the usage patterns of uh, existing products, uh, it can be done by algorithms. And uh, uh, we should learn a study of machine learning here because uh, it helps us to find a way to apply uh, these ideas to our existing products. We also need synthesis tools here. And the best example is Autodesk Dreamcatcher. It is based on, it, on the idea of generative design. And uh, this idea was already used uh, in performances, uh, in industrial design, fashion, architecture for many years. Uh, however, a generative approach is not yet established in digital product design because it doesn't help to solve utilitarian tasks. Of course, the work of architects and industrial designers has enough limitations and uh, specificities on its own. But user interfaces are static, so uh, the usage patterns, content and features uh, change over time, often many times. And uh, we can predict some working process uh, out of uh, the idea of generative design applied to digital product design. At the first step, an algorithm generates many variations of a design using predefined rules and patterns. Then, the results are filtered based on design quality and task requirements. Next, designers and managers choose the most interesting and adequate variations, polishing them if needed. And finally, a design system runs a b test for one or several variations, and then humans choose the most effective of them. It's yet to know how we can filter a huge number of concepts, concepts in digital product design, in which usage scenarios are so varied. If algorithms could also help to filter generated objects, our job would be even more productive and creative. And here's an experimental tool called Frené by John Gold, who worked at the grid. Uh, it shows the idea in action, so uh, you can uh, choose uh, typefaces, um, font sizes and colors uh, for button, and then it generates an endless number of forms for you. It's a simple idea, but it shows can it be applied to uh, our uh, area of product design. 
Uh, John calls it uh, brute force design because it generates so much concepts and we should find a way to filter those concepts. But he emphasizes the importance of a professional being in control. But two of those tools already exist. Uh, unfortunately, there are not so much of them uh, except of those experiments. Uh, there are tools that are a bit similar to what we do, like LogoJoy. It replaces freelancers for a simple logo design. So uh, it asks you a couple of questions, and then it generates an endless number of uh, logo variations for you. And it also applies it to uh, a corporate style, and it sh you can uh, order a uh, print design right away from here. Uh, you can also look at what Adobe does, because they also constantly add smart features to its products. Uh, recently, Photoshop learned to complete a missing part of a photo. And they also have a lot of experiments, like Zenscape. Uh, it can automatically refine a design layout for you. They also launched a platform called Adobe Sensei. Uh, it uses machine learning and it will be the foundation for future smart features in Adobe's products. So we should look at experimental ideas and tools. They could become a part of the digital uh, product designer's day-to-day -day toolkit. And here's a huge collection of those concepts. Uh, it's a website called creative.ai. Uh, it has concepts from different areas of design, industrial design, architecture, digital design, and many, many other areas. And as John McCarthy said, he's a guy who coined the term artificial intelligence. He said that as soon as it works, no one calls it AI anymore. So, to conclude, you see, this is the story of a beautiful, beautiful future, but we should remember the limits uh, of algorithms. They're built on rules uh, defined by humans if the rules are being supercharged now with machine learning. The power of a, des of a designer is that we can make and break rules. So in a year from now, we can define a uh, beautiful or something totally different. And uh, to sum up my point, with uh, those tools, algorithm driven design tools, we can remove the routine of preparing assets and content, uh, which is more or less mechanical work. We can also broaden creative exploration, where a computer makes combinations of variables while the designer filters results to find the best variations. We can also optimize the user interface for another audience segments or even specific users. We can also quickly adapt a design to various platforms and devices to do in a primitive way. And we can experiment with different parts of a user interface in particular patterns, ideally automatically. However, there are downsides too. Because we can only talk about uh, a company's custom solutions uh, in the context of the company's own tasks. And as the great CMS shows, a tool alone can do miracles. Without a designer at the helm, its results usually will, will be mediocre. And breaking past business styles and solutions becomes harder. And finally, copying another designer's work becomes easier if a generative design tool can dig for dribble and copy those ideas to another designer. But, you see, digital product, uh, products are getting more and more complex every year. We need to support more platforms, tweak the scenarios for more user segments, and hypothesize more. So, rather than hire more and more designers, we can upload uh, routine tasks to a computer and let it play with the phones. So, you see, the revolution is already happening, so why don't we lead it? And I refer back to the website where there are, there are a lot of uh, much more examples and if you have any other examples that I don't list, uh, don't list here on, or on my website, you can feel free to send it to me and I will include it here. And so thank you and I hope that you will not scared and you will try to apply these ideas to your work.